Thrombosis TV here at the 2015 ISTH conference in Toronto. I'm Thomas Baldrick, joined now by Dr. Gerald Levy from Duke University. Thanks for coming by, sir. Great. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Let's talk about your conference, day two here at this conference. Uh, what have you seen so far that's been impactful? Well, today was the late-breaking clinical trials, which I thought was very interesting. First, the bridge study about whether to bridge with warfarin or not was presented. Um, and interesting how the outcomes um, really suggested that there was no need to bridge one stopping warfarin. This was, uh, again, excluded patients for neurosurgery, uh, cardiac surgery, but I think, uh, you know, the bulk of the patients. I thought that was very interesting. Jim Ducatis is the first author, and it's in the New England Journal, so very interesting data. Tom Wartell presented it. Um, and a very interesting study. So it gives us more insight in the complexity of the anticoagulation, especially in the perioperative space where there's surgical intervention and major surgical injury. The second, um, there are two other studies, obviously the adnexinat study, which I thought was very interesting. Mark Crowler um, updated us with some information about its efficacy and utilization for apixaban, which was interesting. And then also, today was the day they presented the recess AD study, which is the uh, ituzumab reversal of dabigatran. Um, and it's a study that has two parts. One, patients coming with acute bleeding, and the patients requiring procedural intervention. That also was published today in the New England Journal of Medicine, but a very interesting study. And disclosure, I'm on the steering committee for that particular study. So I think the whole realm of having specific therapeutic agents now for reversal of the anticoagulants, whether they're bleeding or for urgent procedural surgical intervention, is really a very important paradigm that now starts to evolve. And as the realization of these agents soon hopefully to be approved um, has been reported today, I think it's really an exciting new time with new therapeutic paradigms for managing patients on a variety of the non-vitamin K or direct oral anticoagulant. So that's very exciting. Also, you know, the subcommittees met over the weekend, which is also, I think, really exciting. We were working on this perioperative hemostasis group. I work with Jim Ducatis, Alex Baropoulos, Charles Muck, um, Andreas Greniker, and we're developing, hopefully, more and more insight and perspective of managing patients um, on a variety of anticoagulants and other therapeutic interventions require urgent surgery after trauma. So that's interesting. And also, I was involved in speaking on management of DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, in the ICU and in the, in the critical care arena. We also had a panel as part of the, uh, the weekend on the new oral anticoagulants with Alex Baropoulos, Jim Ducatis, Charles Muck, Samama, um, and uh, uh, several others, Pierre Abadadejo from France, discussing some of the perioperative management, bleeding coagulopathy, and importance of both anticoagulation, and again, discussing some of the new reversal strategies, which I think is really important, and gonna be, again, a novel therapeutic approach for clinicians. What do you see as key take-home points for clinical practice from this conference? Well, the key take-home points for clinical practice, I think, are several fold. One, there are evolving strategies for managing patients in 2015 who bleed on the direct oral anticoagulants. Um, and I think there's growing use of the prothrombin complex concentrates. Two, there are specific reversal strategies that are evolving, i.e. adnexinat for the 10A inhibitors and low molecular weight heparin, and it is Susamab for specifically for dabigatran reversal. And I'm thinking by the end of the year, um, in another year or so, these agents hopefully will be in clinical practice. And then, Third, um, the whole idea of managing patients on anticoagulants for procedural intervention is really, I think, we've re-evolved our understanding, our thinking, our management. And it's interesting because how patients often on warfarin get bridged, or warfarin even on the novel or direct oral anticoagulants get bridged with low molecular weight heparin, which has many of the similar pharmacokinetic effects as the direct oral anticoagulants. So I think in renal failure, the half-lives are prolonged in a lot of interesting perspectives. So I think we're really understanding a better perspective on perioperative management of anticoagulation. One of the really important perspectives that I think will evolve in the future 
with the reversal strategies is our whole bridging strategy will totally change. In other words, patients who need urgent surgery, even maybe elective surgery, what will happen is I'll come in, keep them on their non-vitamin K or direct oral anticoagulant, take them into procedures, just before the procedure reverse it in certain high-risk procedural interventions or stop it or reverse it, um, the ones that potentially need to be bridged, keep it going, reverse it before procedure, do the procedure, wait your 24, 48 hour period, and then reinitiate anticoagulation. I really believe it's gonna provide a new therapeutic management strategy that'll be very important. Is that or is there something else maybe the most important thing that you're looking forward to in the next 12 months? Well, of all the things on the horizon, I think uh, approval of the specific reversal agents for the 10A inhibitors as well as for the direct thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran, is the one that is most in grasp and, and should be approved quite soon, uh, perhaps the next year. And I think the data really is very interesting and very exciting. Very good, doctor. Thanks for sharing your insights. Thank you very much time. for the opportunity. You got it.